It is Monday, April 22nd, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. Oh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is Earth Day. People don't pay attention to it as much as they used to. Um... Feels like we need more than a day. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And we also need a society that is willing to recognize the dire urgency of what's going on with the planet, climate change. And as a way to recognize that, we've got a guest today. This is a pre tape show. We're on vacation. It's one of our famous... Um, vacation style guest interviews so famous we don't even name it in a way that can be uttered by by humans in a casual way you gotta almost rename it every time you utter it so like I say it is our famous vacation great guest week see that new different name gotta come up with a different name each time today on the program Hannah Holman on Dust Bowls of Empire. Hannah Holloman is a, an assistant professor of sociology at Amherst College and the author of Dust Bowls of Empire, uh, put out on uh, Yale University Press. It, um, it is fascinating when we see that things like the Dust Bowl is a function of the way that we structure society and the way that we pursue really human development in some fashion uh, brings us these catastrophes and we could I don't want to be a spoiler spoiler alert more coming so um, we talked to Hannah Holloman about this Uh, we should tell you this week uh, we have all new interviews all week Make sure you check them out. Believe me, all of these are fascinating interviews that we uh, have done. We just managed to find, you know, sometimes you get lucky. We got a lucky streak, a lot of interesting stuff uh, this week. Check it out. I think tomorrow we're talking to somebody about Sandra Day O'Connor, and I get on my hobby horse about the, um, about, uh, the Supreme Court. Oh, in fact, there was a little bit of controversy at the end of that. Remember, Brendan? Uh, we got to remind me about that when we uh, we record that because I claimed something to a guest and the guest was like, uh, no. It was literally one of those, uh, what was it? Was it Malcolm McLaren moment in, uh, was it McLuhan? Marshall or? McLuhan. McLuhan. I always get mixed up between McLaren and McLuhan in that uh, Woody Allen film. It's like, I wish M- uh, McLuhan was right here and then McLuhan steps out. Well, I claimed something about Newsweek and a reporting piece they were going to do in the wake of 9-11 about the Supreme Court or that was planned before the uh, before 9-11 and got bumped because of uh, of 9-11. And he's like, uh, I was the managing editor of Newsweek. That didn't happen. And then and then. After the interview ended, I had him on. I'm like, I could have sworn that happened. And I Googled it and I found the, at least the article. So, I didn't, what, what's that? You were right. I was right, but why did I get the gong? I don't know, I don't use the gong enough. Yeah, but gonging is usually when, like maybe I just have that from the gong show, that's when you get pulled off. Oh, I've been, I'm aware, I'm aware I, of that. I was right about the article, but I was wrong that it was gonna be on the cover, but I'm not sure, uh, when, you're not, when you're wrong about the existence of the article, I'm not, mm. anyways. But it's a fascinating uh, uh, story of uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, Supreme Court. Um, very quaint. It'll be much even much more quaint in years to come. So right now, ladies and gentlemen, it is Monday. Um, we left, uh, and I was speaking about me and the, my two kids on a jet plane yesterday. Flew down to Florida. 
I drove inland from West Palm Beach. Uh, hopefully, things are going well for me. So, I don't know. There's a lot of alligators around there, too. So, we'll see. I may be having problems. Doing a little barnstorming around Florida. So, I should come back tan and exhausted. Meanwhile, I should tell you, the majority report is being supported in part by Simple Habit. Simple Habit is a mobile app that provides a massive and diverse library of five-minute guided meditations. And the majority report audience can try Simple Habit totally free for an entire week when you go to simplehabit.com slash majority. Look, there's a huge amount of uh, scientific uh, evidence that's come out about the benefits of meditating. People have been saying this for a long time. And if you've had any experience meditating, you know that it can be incredibly calming and clarifying. Simple Habit has over 2,000 guided meditations specific, specifically designed for different parts of your day, just about anything you might be dealing with in life. They have guided meditations for mindfulness, meditations for anxiety, for depression, or for when you're having trouble falling asleep, meditations for when you're wanting to overcome procrastination, or when you have something important going on at work, meditations designed for parents. I'm going to be testing out the meditations designed for parents. If I can get five minutes in to maybe just not lose my stack with my kids because they're being so obnoxious. They have meditations specifically for when you're waking up or your lunch break or when you've just gotten home from work or when you're going to bed. And this is the thing I like about Simple, uh, simple Habit is that it makes it easy. I don't know when I'm going to have time to do my parenting meditation with the kids. You got different people who are trying to accomplish different things with meditation. Simple Habit is able to cater to just about anyone. Doesn't matter what your goals are. Doesn't matter how much past experience you've had with meditation. The variety of guided meditations on Simple Habit is what sets it apart. Simple Habit just won the 2018 Google Play Award for Best Well-Being App. It's available on iOS, Android, and web browser. And the Majority Report audience can try it for free for a week by going to simplehabit.com slash majority. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening, we've put uh, descriptions in, uh, or I should say we've put links in the descriptions of both. Check it out. Also, one of today's sponsors is Skillshare. And anyone who goes to skl.sh majority report two, it's the number two, is going to get two, as in the number two, whole months of totally free access to Skillshare's entire library of super quality online courses and tutorials. Skillshare is a vibrant online learning community that offers courses on everything from design to video editing, photography, business, technology, cooking, meditation. Everything in between. There are Skillshare courses for everyone. You'll have no problem finding courses that are going to be useful for you both in your personal life and in your business life. Whether you want to sharpen your skills with something you already love doing or you want to learn how to do something totally new, Skillshare has you covered. Maybe I'll learn to code. If courses for entrepreneurs, courses on computer coding, web development, personal nutrition, I could use that too. Learning new languages, Jamie wants to do that. Photoshop, you name it. You want to learn how to illustrate and procreate? I don't even know what that is, but I bet you a lot of people who work with, uh, with illustrating do. Gives you, it teaches you how to draw a shareable time lapse. Uh, photo and film. You can get the uh, fundamentals of photo editing. Or how to take pro pictures on your phone. Everybody's got a phone. Just even watching stuff like that is like above your sort of like uh, pay grade. Like, you know, do it yourself cinematography. Make your videos look more like a movie. And the beauty of this is you get two months free. So there's really no like waste. You can you could do stuff that you're only going to take maybe one thing away from and it's still worth it. Building an Etsy shop that sells. Productivity habits, I could use that. You can get two entire months of free access to every single course offered by Skillshare by going to skl.sh slash majority report two. Just think of everything you're going to have at your fingertips for two whole months. Again, that's skl.sh slash majority report two. I put a link underneath this video on YouTube. I put a link underneath this podcast in our podcast description Check it out, skl.sh slash Majority Report 2. All right, quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking to Professor Hannah Holloman about empires and dust bowls and ecological disasters and lessons of history. Right. 
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Assistant Professor of Sociology at Amherst College, author of Dust Bowls of Empire, Imperialism, Environmental Politics, and the Injustice of Green Capitalism. Hannah Hallman, uh, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. So, uh, Hannah, let's start with, first off, because I think um, I think there are probably more folks than uh, we would imagine who are just simply not aware, or to the extent that they are not uh, deeply aware, of what the Dust Bowl was. Sure. Well, so the Dust Bowl is a, is a term that's used to refer to an ecological crisis that was situated in the Southern Plains region of the United States and that really reached its peak in the 1930s. And so when most people refer to the Dust Bowl, they're talking about the crisis of soil erosion that follow and um, that was exacerbated by drought in the 1930s, but that followed the expansion of cash crop agriculture in the Southern Plains region. And so the Southern Plains region, a lot of the ecology there are these incredible grasslands. And I don't know if your um, listeners are not familiar, these, these na- grasses that developed on the Southern Plains have roots that are, you know, go down 8, 12, 14 feet underground. When all of that was um, plowed up to expand agriculture and ranching, it left the soil loose and bare. And so that um, expand the cash crop agriculture expanded really rapidly in the region in the late 1800s, but especially in the early 1900s and during World War One. And um, when drought descended on the region in the 1930s, that loosened um, dried soil just lifted into the air and wreaked havoc across the land. And so your listeners may be familiar with images of the Okies or folks from Texas going out west because they were displaced from the land because of the Dust Bowl. Um, Ken Burns made a um, kind of famous documentary about it. But a lot of those images that we associate with the 1930s, especially displaced farmers um, from that region, the the cause of that was the combination of the Dust Bowl. And um, obviously this was taking place at the same time as the Great Depression. And so it was a it was a serious social and ecological crisis in the Southern Plains region in the 1930s. How much of the the I mean, I guess, you know, uh, some data points I'm curious about, like, I mean, how many how many people are we talking about vaguely uh, or, or specifically, I guess, uh, who, who were displaced, uh, essentially in many respects, becoming internal re- refugees. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And and to what extent did this. Um, exacerbate uh, the the Great Depression. Right. Well, so for farmers that were on the affected land, it was obviously devastating. You already have an economic collapse that, that led to displacement of peoples from many parts of the United States. People were roaming around looking for work, whether they were living in rural areas or living in cities. But the combination of depression and Then this ecological crisis where these farms like literally dried up and blew away um, led to especially hard times in that um, region, which I I don't know if I mentioned encompassed parts of New Mexico, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma and Texas. And so tens of thousands of people were displaced and due to a combination of factors, there's the Dust Bowl and that ecological crisis making them really environmental refugees or ecological refugees. And then um, some of them also were displaced by economic factors. But it was a massive crisis, one of the largest in scale in U.S. history. I mean, we're talking about a couple of million people, right? I mean, from like uh, Texas, New Mexico, um, Oklahoma, Nebraska, Kansas. Um, and so, and people just completely uprooting their lives, um, and going to places that they have, they don't obviously don't know what's on the other end in many respects. Mm -hmm. So there were, so there is in terms of the specific number, um, there, I'm not sure that if it's a couple of minutes, just a million, just due to the ecological crisis, but yeah, tens of thousands were definitely displaced and people, yeah, literally lost their livelihoods and because of the economic conditions that they were already living in even before the depression and before 
the major droughts of the 1930s, people really didn't have anything to, to leave with, uh, or a lot of people didn't. And so they were really down and out and going places out west during a depression where you already have a lot of people in places like California out of work caused all kinds of enmity between the local California um, workers and the new kind of Okies who were streaming in um, willing to do any kind of work just to try to survive during that period. Okay, and so um, we we have a sense of, of of the size of this catastrophe, and it becomes relevant because I think there is, um, uh, you know, there's an argument that at one point I don't know when in the future we may um, see more of this, or and to a certain extent, not necessarily in this country, but around the world, we're already seeing um, uh, some of this. But let's go back, and um, and I guess. W- Talk about the, the, the sort of the run up uh, to the Dust Bowl, but specifically in the context of what what has been our understanding of the phenomena of the Dust Bowl and what has been wrong with that understanding? Sure. So that's really a big part of the book was reinterpreting the Dust Bowl because it because of the, the issues you just mentioned, especially climate change leading to the sort of um, the desertification of areas around the world and and that coupled with the increasing problem of soil degradation that we still have today, you're starting to see people displaced from agricultural regions, um, semi-arid and arid regions, especially around the world. And so that has led to this renewed interest in the Dust Bowl. So you have all kinds of um, scientists, scholars, policymakers, journalists referring to the Dust Bowl because that is the historical Um, episode that looks most like what we are expected to see more of in the future under climate change. So the Dust Bowl has become this very prominent historical referent in the climate change era. But the problem with that is that the majority of people who um, write about it and who talk about it, they they don't know that much about what was going on at the time and have a very limited understanding of of the drivers of it. And that um, was what I wanted to deal with in my book because the Dust Bowl is often treated as a very specific regional phenomena that agricultural methods that were more suited to humid regions were imported to an arid region, and that was one of the predominant drivers of the crisis, as well as the sort of economic pressures of the period. But what I do in my book is actually look what, look at what was happening in the global context. And so whereas some scholars have attributed the what they call the great plow up in the Southern Plains to the ignorance of the farmers, to bad policy in the United States, to um, bad agricultural technique. I actually situate it within the expansion in the late 1800s and early 1900s via colonialism and imperialism of cash crop agriculture and the integration of the first global food regime that really takes place um, during that late 19th century, early 20th century. So okay, a lot of so people let me, focused, let me oh, just uh, stop here just so ahead. that we can sort of, yes. um, um, you know, uh, I, I can put a, a finer uh, point on this. So sure. the analysis that we have seen of the Dust Bowl uh, heretofore has been that there were mistakes that were made that were technological in their nature or, you know, specifically agricultural in their nature, mistakes that uh, are untethered to um, any other sort of major driving forces, but rather, you know, um, we were technologically or, I guess, agriculturally limited in our knowledge. And uh, we, and by we, I mean, obviously, the farmers uh, applied, uh, you know, misapplied techniques or misunderstood the techniques that they had acquired. Or um, we, you know, there was just, these were technological uh, mistakes rather than uh, driven by a compulsion that um, rather than driven by a a broader set of values that made it almost impossible not to make these mistakes exactly exactly so yeah that it's um, led to a pretty limited idea of what the what the root causes were and also then what the solutions were so if you have a technological diagnosis of a problem, then the solution is to change the technology or change the technique um, or change policy, 
you know, towards better conservation practices and so on. But what a lot of people don't know, even though some scholars have pointed to broader economic factors like Donald Worcester's, one of the, the great historian of the Dust Bowl, he did look at the broader sort of economy um, and the ruling capitalist ethos, as he called it, that brought Henry Fordism to the plains, which is how he put it. So he did look at those, he looked at those economic factors, but overlooked even in his analysis was a sort of broader global perspective that looked at colonial and imperial policies on the part of not just the United States, but Britain, European powers, and even Japan in that era that led to a a particular maltreatment of the land in frontier regions around the globe um, in the late 1900s and early 20th, early um, 20th century. And so that... And and let me just be clear on what you're saying there is that um, it was not necessarily that there, that, that all of these, uh, that, that there were that all of these different players internationally were implicated in the Dust Bowl per se, but rather yeah. they were all engaged in practices that were um, that that could have theoretically turned into their own Dust Bowls, uh, and that these practices that they were similar is indicative of a a, a broader sort of uh, societal ideological um, perspective. That would lead to these things. In other words, that like it was these, the Dust Bowl naturally accrued, and part of the evidence is that um, internationally, other entities were engaging in stuff that could have easily turned into dust bowls. Well, and other places did turn into dust bowls. That's the, that's one of the big issues that's sort of left out of most contemporary analysis of the dust bowl in the United States is that the problem of soil erosion was actually. Um, I would argue one of the first, if not the first, global environmental problem. So with the, if you think about it, and I'll just walk everybody back a little bit in history, but in the late um, 1800s, you have this massive global land grab on the part of the major imperial powers. They were particularly interested in resources, in land for the expansion of cash crop agriculture, and in cheap labor. And so with the expansion of cash crop agriculture around the world at that time, at this time on the part of these imperial powers and this kind of massive land grab that was justified, obviously, through kind of white supremacist logic and, and all of the other um, colonial justifications for these practices, you have in, in all of the areas around the world where this expansion took place, you, you develop a problem with soil erosion and land degradation more broadly. And so by the early 1900s, you have colonial officials around the world and in mainstream newspapers around the world reporting on a global crisis of soil erosion. So by the time you get to the 1930s, and, and the Dust Bowl on the Southern Plains, if you look back at the literature and, and historical documents from that period, everybody um, writing was very clear that this was not a local problem um, that was just um, a product of practices in the Southern Plains, that this was actually a global problem associated with the expansion of white territorial control and cash crop agriculture. Okay, so... Um when the the concurrent writing was about this phenomena w- did they did did the writing reflect that it was a function of of i mean how did they uh contextualize it in real time i mean was it you in know, the 1930s yeah i mean i mean yeah, if it so- is the case that the the evidence that this was international was that's the way people were writing about it like this is a phenomena that's happening around the world did they simply say like as a species, we need to develop better technologies to deal with this? Or was it like, wow, what a coincidence, uh, the weather's all like this? Or was it, um, or was it just looking at the, uh, the reality of the situation? Like how much of the analysis that you're talking about with it being driven by a form of white supremacy and colonialism, how much of that was like sort of, how much of that awareness was, was embedded in the coverage, if you will, at the time? So if you if you read newspapers from that time period, like international newspapers, if you read the work of even soil scientists like there and, and I document all of this in my book and, and pull out a lot of examples from the literature at that time. I mean, it was it was very mainstream to understand this problem, this global problem of soil erosion as a product of colonial expansion 
And it was talked about in those terms that this is an outcome of colonial expansion because we are now in control of these different parts of the world. We need to figure out um, what to do about it. There was a lot of anxiety about recently acquired territory being lost if they didn't address the issue of soil erosion and obviously the um, the kind of investments in the development of this land internationally was at stake for um, you know the people who were profiting from um, ca- the expansion of cash crop ac- agriculture. So there, for colonial officials, for soil scientists, for journalists writing at the time, it was actually described um, even in a newspaper in Springfield, Massachusetts, close to where I live now, as a, another white man's burden on a world scale. And so one, a couple of soil scientists, for example, who were very um, well-known, well-respected in Britain, and they wrote a famous book called The Rape of the Earth. It, that was its British title. It was also published in the United States. But they, they said that the, the white man's burden in the future will be to come to terms with the soil and that may be just as difficult as coming to terms with the native. And they talked about the fact that everywhere that the sort of um, Anglo-European approach to agriculture had um, spread, which basically was the, the spread of capitalist agriculture and industrial, increasingly industrialized agriculture was experiencing these problems. So that they had, that was well understood. There was no reason to, you know, they, they were, dealing with a lot of other problems associated with um, colonial expansion. And so this was just seen as, a, as another um, crisis that they needed to deal with. And to do so, we're sharing expertise um, across these different um, colonial contexts. So it, so this was, was considered it as, was, as, as, as a almost like a logistical challenge to uh, exactly. the, the expansion that, um, you know, we ne- there was no questioning of the expansion in the policies. It was just right. like this is a logistical and maybe technological challenge to our desire to increase our growth. And it is an uh, urgent one because of the tremendous amount of investment that we have made to make this expansion. Exactly. OK. And so um, so there isn't um, and and I imagine the. To the extent that there's the, the, there's white supremacy and uh, in you know sort of I guess uh, colonialism um, expressed in this, it is not in a self-conscious way. Uh, it is um, uh, white supremacy insofar as like you know this is our job taken for granted. Right. Yeah. Uh, th- this the, is the white supremacy is taken for granted. I mean, and this is what the soil. I mean, when you read some of the writing of these soil scientists, this is basically what they say. They're saying. Well, you know, it's it's the it's as the white man, it's our job. We're the only ones that can do it, even though we've caused the problems. We're the only ones in a position to solve it. So there's almost and a, that may mean there's almost like a religious mostly. quality to this, right? I mean, which I guess is you know spurs a lot of this uh, colonialism and imperialism, anyways. Which is you know it is our we're put here on the earth to exploit all of it and to and if there's any obstacles to that exploitation, it is uh, our obligation. Um, and we can't shirk from it to figure it out. Exactly. And that is not an exaggeration. Anyone familiar with literature from that time period would say you could not overstate the fact that that's the way that that was the predominant view at the time. And so W.B. Du Bois, the famous sociologist and activist writing in that time period, he said, whiteness is the ownership of the earth forever and ever. Amen that that was the ideology of, of the period called known as the new imperialism, um, which is generally dated from like the 1870s to um, the first couple of decades of the 1900s. And so that, yes, you're, it's not an exaggeration. It's not just a theoretical perspective that I have. That was the way um, policy and, and the role, especially of Anglo-European and U.S. Of, uh, officials, that's the way they saw themselves and, and what their role was what their destiny was in on this planet, and um, uh, so that that ideology leads us to uh, do things that, um, are in some ways, are impossible. Like you cannot exploit a finite resource uh, without depleting it. And I mean, it almost gets down to that, right? And it's like the 
Um, the, these are not, I mean, I mean, is that ultimately where we're at when the dust bowl hits is just simply too much. The, the, that compulsion that is justified by the fact that, you know, we're white and this is what we were put on earth to do. Um, but the compulsion to, uh, increase in size and to, uh, expand, um, the, the, the land literally cannot sustain it. Exactly. And I think that this is the problem we still have today and that wasn't challenged during that period, which is why the problem of soil erosion, as much as we know about it and as much as we've known about it for literally 100 years, I mean, they, they, they were studying um, the problem of soil erosion in the, I mean, I mean, really going back such a long time. It's like, so what, why, why wasn't it addressed? And uh, that idea that we are put on earth to control to exploit for profit and to um and it's not it's our right and our duty to develop the land um that it's a major problem and i think that the today i mean people ask me so what's the point of talking about the dust bowl as an outcome of colonialism and white supremacy what does that have to do with today and i think that Today, we still have this idea that's very problematic, that's tied up, I think, with the history of colonial ideology, that some places and some people are are disposable, that it's okay. You know, like we talk about climate change in the United States, for example, we talk about climate policy as if we're just making a choice about our own greenhouse gas emissions, and we know we have an impact on, on the broader world, but it's always a, a debate whether we it's going to cost us too much to make any changes as if we even have the right to make that decision and impose that on the rest of the world. That's a very colonial perspective on your own environment, on on environmental policy in this country. And I think that comes straight out of that colonial era. And you're sitting debating the cost to you and admitting kind of at the same time, it's going to cause problems, you know, not doing something about climate change or, or emissions is going to cause problems around the world, but maybe we can't. Maybe it's better for us, though, if we carry on as we are. That's just an incredible um, hubris and an incredible, um, uh, like, h- horrible perspective and um, attitude towards other people and places on the planet that I think comes straight out of that. Same um, tradition. Well, exactly. Be- before we, I, I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves but uh and because i want to go back and talk about the response to the dust bowl um you know in in a more material way as well as i mean because i think Mm -hmm. you've just articulated uh that the response at least in terms of an ideological one was just simply to look at it as a technological issue but even Mm -hmm. looking at the concept of it costing us right right presumes that the the that what we're doing is really just foregoing a uh, uh, that it's actually that we're paying out as opposed to foregoing a future profit that wasn't necessarily ours right, right. does that make sense i yeah. mean the the yeah. uh, and and that is like that even it seems to me the um the frame of what's it going to cost us on some level implicates, you know, is indicates that we have a certain supremacy and that we're spending that the, that it's, it's a cost as opposed to our being foreclosed from expending other people's assets and uh, whether the future assets or other people around the world. Right. Right. And it gives primacy to a kind of um, a really narrow quantitative, I mean, quantitative and narrow view of what cost even means, like who who's paying the cost and and what that even means. It's all expressed in it tends to be expressed in monetary terms, but obviously, the higher reality of um, our ecological existence is complete, and not just ours, like you said, everybody else on the planet and all living beings, not just humans, is completely ignored. And so the fact that that's even brought up um, subject to cost benefit analysis is is outrageous when you start looking at it from a more um, ecologically and, and socially realistic perspective. 
Well, I mean, is is the problem, uh, you know, because this is really about, uh, I mean, this is all addresses, right, how how we responded to uh, the Dust Bowl. And that response has not, I mean, changed. I mean, there was there was uh, investment in trying to to fix it. And and, and I, I do want to get there because I, I just want to I want to okay. just illustrate that. But mm-hmm. is it is it the case that a cost benefit analysis um, is inherently um, problematic or is it that we're not properly filling up those ledgers and uh, the costs aren't necessarily, you know, that we're the, the, the benefits aren't necessarily ones that are ours, right. That, uh, that we should, right. that we are due. I mean, I mean, can we do a cost benefit analysis um, that does not exclude externalities that don't directly implicate us or externalities that we have just decided subjectively, Oh, that's not really a, a cost. That's just, that's just nature or, you know, or that that happens across the border. So that doesn't that's not a cost that 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 we need to calculate. We have to bear. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, I mean, I think that there are some um, some it depends on what we mean by cost benefit analysis, I guess. Um, but I would say like monetary cost benefit analysis is completely inadequate to right. addressing any um, major ecological or social issue. It'll never seem, given the way economic accounting works in the current um, in, in the world that we currently live in, that it can never accommodate the range of ethical and social questions that we have to ask ourselves when making decisions as a society about um, how we're going to organize society and, and what that means for the rest of the world and for um, the broader ecological basis of our existence. So I don't think even there, there are a lot of proposals to internalize the sort of externalities in the sense of costing nature. So can we really um, try to put a monetary value on all of those externalities that you're talking about? And I think even that is, is problematic because it ignores the sort of political and ethical aspects of these questions that can't be reduced to a monetary framework. And so there was the great ecologist um, Howard Odom. He was concerned about the development of environmental economics because he, he said that their entire goal was to internalize the externalities. And he said what we really needed to do was externalize the internalities, <laughs> Um, quit subjecting so much of the planet to economic calculus and start talking about the real, um, the sort of the political and ethical aspects that are hidden when we put things in that framework. So rather than impose our value on um, on uh, the, you know, taking in uh, the, the globe essentially as an input into our values, rather we uh, take the values that are outside of us and impose them upon our calculations. Exactly. All right. So what, so just, I mean, briefly, and this may be going backwards just a little bit, but what the response to the Dust Bowl, I mean, what, um, how was it adequate for the moment perhaps, but inadequate for, and I think we've just explained to a certain extent how it's inadequate for our future mm-hmm. and for society at large, but, uh, but just uh, briefly, I mean, go back, um, uh, if you will, in, because I know, the, the the second half of the book in ma- in many respects is to sort of uh, address this question. Mm-hmm. So the res- so there were many responses to the Dust Bowl that were tied up with responses in, the, in during the New Deal era to the Depression overall, and so those are those are very intertwined. And it's it's there were so many different programs. I I I can't give a thorough kind of analysis in a, in a short amount of time. But I will say that some of the most important responses to the Dust Bowl in particular were more government support for conservation, more education and um, programs meant to um, teach farmers improved agricultural technique. Some land was purchased by the government or farmers were paid to take it completely out of production, which needed to happen because some of the land shouldn't have been farmed to begin with or shouldn't have been farmed as intensively as it was. And so a lot of those programs, educational programs, conservation programs, um, teaching new techniques, um, taking marginal lands out of production, those were successful in a lot of areas in the sense of halting some of the worst aspects of the crisis. Like um, they replanted grasslands there. I'm actually from Oklahoma. You can still see 
signs where they put in shelter tree shelter belts of trees and things like that. And so they were able to deal with some of the more um, immediate aspects of the problem. And also there were some support that helped um, rural communities out of economic kind of co- complete calamity and so on. So all of those were were great programs and there were proposals for even more radical um, conservation programs and, and more radical um, approaches to sort of agricultural and rural community planning that are um, that were very exciting. A lot of those got squashed in the end or defunded and so they couldn't be implemented. So the response was not as robust as it as it, it could have been based on the ideas that were around at the time. But um, but there were some improvements in regional economic and ecological conditions in uh, as a result of these government programs. However, um, they were not adequate in the sense of they did not check the further kind of development and industrialization of agriculture in that region. So by the 1950s, when you have another series of major droughts, you can see a lot of the same problems that were evident in the 1930s become evident again, the state of the land and so on. And so that's happened periodically again and again in in that region. And today, for example, um, there's a there's a massive um, crisis. People are very concerned in the long term about the state of water, the state of the land, and so on. And so what what we talked about earlier, the fact that there are people being displaced around the world because of changes in rural conditions and a climate change. Like that's actually already happening right. in the Southern Plains region again. So, okay. So there's two different types of responses that can be effective and to varying degrees. Like the idea of, 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 of saying to uh, farmers like, don't, you know, you're getting paid to not grow here. Or of right. taking land and saying these are conservation areas, that is f- uh, f- uh, uh, fundamentally anti-colonial, right? And uh, because it is uh, anti-imperialistic. I mean, obviously we're you know um, uh, because it is narrowing the um, the sort of the natural resources that can be consumed by the the machine, as it were, right? That wants mm-hmm. to to profitize these. Then there is a more and and to the extent that we didn't go further with those sort of material uh, projects are why we continue to have this problem. But then there's also a more sort of, I guess, metaphorical response that could have been we need to fundamentally alter the dynamic between this need for uh, expansive um, uh, profit if we're going to um, protect the environment more broadly. Exactly. And I mean, this is, I didn't mention it earlier, but one of the develop a little bit later development in the Southern Plains region to address the problem of, um, of drought and, and soil issues in that region was the development of aquifers and groundwater and the building of large reservoirs and all sorts of other types of water um, development programs. And one of the things you see, so that was meant to try to address the fact that they're still growing crops in that region that actually shouldn't be grown there, like cotton, you know, corn, things that are really water intensive um, crops that have no business um, being grown there from an ecological perspective. But if you have these sort of unsustainable props to that development through these um, different sort of like especially exploiting the aquifers then you can sustain an unsustainable system over time but now you see the consequences of that over the long term are that now um, there are some scholars who have done work on you know the de- depletion of the aquifers and uh, you all have probably heard of the Ogallala aquifer which is this massive source of groundwater that goes under um, a number of states in the center of the country, but that now is is getting completely drained. And with the climate heating up and the ground drying out and the depletion of that aquifer, we're, we're kind of back into in the same um, position in that area that we were in, um, not exactly in the 1930s, but there were some scholars, I think, based at the University of Chicago or some scientists who did a study in 2016 that showed if there was another drought on, on the same scale 
um, as that that um, happened in the 1930s, the region was just as susceptible um, to drought as it was at that time because conservation has never gone far enough. And, and we should say, like, those aquifers, you know, and this, this word gets bounding around, I think, too much, but that is the ultimate sort of neoliberal response, right? Like, literally, like, almost down to the textbook. We, will, uh, we have this problem that's been created by our technology and by our search uh, for profit. We will expend money but have the government do it <laughs> to enable right. future profit-making to fix that problem. So we create a problem with this technology. We will solve the problem with other technology. We will get the government right. to pay for it, which is, you know, really full on Mont Pelerin uh, type of uh, style of neoliberalism. And uh, and then we will wait till this problem occurs again. And theoretically, we'll come up with another technological solution. The problem is we've run out on some level. Right. I mean, or I mean, that that that's sort of the 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 analogy that and maybe it's not even yeah. an analogy i mean that's the situation we're in today that's a history right it happens over and over again instead of actually resolving the problem we come up with a technological fix that basically kicks the can further down the road and masks the unsustainability of the situation overall and so in in the and at one point region, at one point it's a game of musical chairs and the music right. ends Right. And I think if you if you drive through the Southern Plains region right now or you drive through, uh, especially further in the southwest, you can see that the music has ended. I mean, if you look at the, I was in um, New Mexico a few years ago for a talk and I mean, the dust, the just the constant sort of dust blowing and everything that the ridification that's happening there is really dramatic. And um, NASA scientists and scientists working at Columbia have said because of climate change, you know, because of climate change and these other um, problems that have developed um, ecologically in that region, we're going to see things like drought and and problems with soil that we saw in the 1930s, but this time for decades at a time. But now we should expect to see it for decades at a time, yeah. And the depletion of the groundwater means one of the ways that we've coped with that over time is um, less and less available to us. And so if you go to water, I've been to some water planning meetings, like Oklahoma State water planning meetings or Texas regional water planning meetings, and they're having a really hard time thinking about where is this water going to come from? What's, what, what are we going to do? Like the entire model there um, is, is highly threatened. And a lot of counties in those states they're just they're they're losing population because people can't make a living there the way that they could in the past. And so it is um, it isn't a let's kind of wait and see what happens. It's like we're already seeing the consequences of having shifted those problems down the road instead of having actually developed a more sustainable economic and um, ecologically sensible model in the in response to the crisis in the early 1900s. Well, the book is Dust Bowls of Empire, Imperialism, Environmental Politics, and the Injustice of Green Capitalism. Hannah Hallman, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was a great conversation. I'd say go straight that guy to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught. See the truth in the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I guess I'm where the choice was made the option where you don't get paid for the road that bends before it finally breaks you I guess I may have lost my drive between the 101 and the 5 do you know how far the detour takes you yeah I know the clock is ticking but the meds are gonna kick in
waiting.